It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar, A Successful Start to Reviving Your Neighborhood. I'm Jean Hammerman. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Creative Land Recycling, also known as CCLEAR. This is part two of a three-part Vacant to Vibrant Land Renewal webinar series brought to you by US EPA Region 9 and CCLEAR. We are recording the session and we'll send it to you with today's PowerPoint. We will also send you the recording of part one, where we introduce the Vacant to Vibrant Initiative, welcoming new communities and covered brownfields basics. We'll discuss what's in part three at the end of today's session. During this webinar, we'll have presentations from EPA and CCLEAR, two whiteboard activities and question and answer period, all to collaborate with you on launching, jumpstarting and enhancing your land reuse program. You all know the drill with webinars. Please put comments and questions in the chat so we can address them in writing or during Q&A. So we're just gonna jump in to lead us off. I am pleased to introduce you to Brooklyn James with US EPA. Brooklyn. Hi, Jean, thanks for the introduction. All right, so Jean covered a little bit of this, but we're just gonna start off with the housekeeping. So here's a short agenda. We're going to do a small introduction and then go into our four P's, partnerships, planning, properties, and productive reuse. And then we'll have our quest question and answer period at the end. So just a couple reminders. Keep your mic on mute while the presentation is going. Put any of your questions in the chat. And we are also going to be using Zoom whiteboard to do some um, interactive questions, and we'll have more instructions on how that's going to go in a bit. So just kind of starting off, we wanted to remind everybody what the definition of a brownfield is. So a brownfield is a property where the current or future use is affected by real or perceived contamination. So just because you're not positive if a property has been contaminated, if you have reason to believe that there's contamination, that can still qualify as a brownfield. And so these environmental contaminations pose a threat to the environment and human health. And so here's some types of automotive repair facilities, railroads, mining, and much more. So how do brownfields affect your community? Well, the brownfields have a potential use for illegal activities to take place, and they can discourage investment. They can also reduce employment opportunities and diminish the quality of life for the people that are living nearby. And they also can cause adjacent properties to lose value and um, prevent economic growth. And then there's something that we call like the broken window effect, which applies metaphorically and literally to brownfields. Essentially, it's when there are minor damages to a property and it can attract a continuation of vandalism and crime in that area. Okay, so now we are going to do a little activity. Um, and here's some of the things that you need to know to get started. So when the Zoom whiteboard pops up, you're going to see a bunch of sticky notes on the screen. And in order to um, put an answer into a sticky note, double click on it, and then you can begin typing. If you need to adjust the sizing of the whiteboard, you can use the magnifying glass tool in the bottom right hand corner to zoom in or zoom out. And then you can also scroll from left to right or up and down to adjust the look of the whiteboard. And then lastly, if you're seeing a lot of cursors with names moving around the screen, and you want to turn that off, you can navigate to the top right hand corner where you see the ellipses or the three dots, go to view and then uncheck collaborators cursors and then that should fix the problem. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to pull up our whiteboard. If you're having any problem seeing the whiteboard in your actual zoom, you can go to the very top right hand corner and click view and change that to full screen or standard and that might let you see the screen a little bit better. Um, so our question for you all is how will land revitalization enhance your community, so this is kind of an open ended question just put your thoughts think about like what are some of your common goals. Um, why is your community interested in land revitalization, you know, what do you want to achieve, um, and things like that. And we'll just kind of talk about some of the things that pop up. 
So I see somebody says removal of blight. That is a great, great answer. Um, that is one thing that reviving or revitalizing brownfields can help with. Yes, new housing opportunities, especially like affordable housing. Those are great reuse options for a brownfield site. Open green and community spaces. Yeah, with EPA resources and CEQLR's help, we can create more of those spaces with uh, reusing brownfields or unused property, which is great. I see one that says community resources and desired services. Yeah, that's a great reuse. More slash safer bicycle transit. Yeah, that is a, that's a good one to call out. Um, we do with the land revitalization technical assistance can provide walkability studies and that will help figure out ways to make your um, community easier to walk or bike around to get around for your community members. More livability, that's a great one. Activation of vacant sites, yes. Possible environmental cleanup. Yeah, that's a great way to enhance the community and remove some of that contamination and possible threat. Increase the safety. Definitely, brownfields are safety concerns, not only for the contamination, but also for the sometimes the crime that they can attract. Building wealth. That's a great, that's a great option. Um, revitalizing your brownfields can definitely help with economic growth, bringing that investment into your town rather than elsewhere. Oh, I like this one, can emphasize cultural and art, definitely. I think some of the brownfield cleanups that we've seen have incorporated murals and other cultural aspects to their reuse, which is really cool and always great. Sense of belonging and pride, I like that. Oh, that's a good point from Devin. If you're having trouble with typing on the whiteboard or adding a sticky note, you can always put your answers in the chat too and we can add them for you. Great, well, these are all really great responses. We'll leave it up for a few more minutes and see if anyone else has anything to add. Oh, I see one up at the top saying, reuse existing underutilized buildings, increasing value. That's great. Not always do you have to demolish a building and start from scratch. There's definitely lots of projects that can reuse infrastructure. Ooh, increase opportunities for small businesses. That's a good one. All right. Well, thank you everyone for putting in your comments. This is awesome. We are going to capture this and probably send it out too um, or discuss it more at the end. So now we're just going to go ahead and switch back to the, the presentation. Okay, let's continue. Oh, yes, we did this. All right, so just a short introduction. Um, part of successfully revitalizing your communities is to really understand the brownfields process and it's very convoluted, but breaking it down and taking a look at it piece by piece can really help. So we decided to kind of split it up into four parts, um, partnerships, planning, properties and productive reuse. And so we're gonna discuss each of these pieces in a little bit more detail, starting with partnerships. So what needs to be done? Um, first of all, when forming your partnerships, you wanna find your people and create your Brownfields team. And this can include people within your local government, community members, stakeholders, business owners, a wide variety of people can be on your Brownfields team. The next thing you wanna do is identify those stakeholders that are within your community. You also want to make sure you're constantly engaging the community throughout the process of forming your partnerships. And then you're gonna to want to find a revitalization champion. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in the next slide, what that is. But lastly, you wanna make sure you clearly define those partner roles so we're moving towards the goal in an effective way. So if you look at this graphic on the right, it kind of shows what all of those partners could be. They could be elected officials, colleges, nonprofits, faith organizations, and the fruits of your labor are essentially what you're going to get out of these relationships, like the reuses, like parks, affordable housing, 
a better sense of community, and then also just forming those long-standing relationships with those people. So we're going to talk about forming your internal team first. So this can be a group of people from your local government offices, like economic and community development, um, the planning office, finance office. If you have a contract or grants office, they would likely be involved. It could be people from environmental. And then you might want to consider um, mayors, city council members, county commissioners, or executive directors from nonprofit organizations, and then even local commissioners, which can be residents from the community. And you really want to think outside of the box when forming your team and finding your champions. One of the um, communities that I work with in the city of Los Angeles, their Brownfields team falls under the sanitation department, and you wouldn't really expect that, but they've got a great team there and it works really well for them. So now just talking a little bit about external partnerships, that kind of gets us into the revitalization champions. So these are people that are really going to be your main fundraisers and they help leverage other resources and push the project forward and really engage with the community. So this might be a community leader. This could be your mayor, um, a nonprofit director, a business owner, or even neighboring communities that are close by. You can have more than one project champion, but it's important to identify them because this is what helps establish trust and transparency with your community when creating your projects. And they're also going to be the ones to really push for the financial and technical assistance and fundraising, like I mentioned, and also really drive that project implementation. So I just wanted to bring up this example from Nevada. This is the Centennial Fine Arts Center. And I feel like it's a good example of external partnerships being formed to get a project done. So this building here, um, it's on the National Historic Places list. And it was built in 1927. So there were concerns about um, asbestos containing materials and lead-based paints in the building. And so there was a community group, the White Pine uh, Community Choir, that requested a phase one and phase two environmental site assessment be done and just look at the um, disrepair that was going on in the building because they would like to see it restored for community use. And so they partnered with Nye County of Nevada, which were the ones that actually applied for the grant. And then they also had support from the Rural Desert Southwest Brownfields Coalition to get that project moving forward. Okay, so the last piece of the partnership is community engagement. And this piece is very important. So we want to make sure that we are engaging the community through all processes of the Brownfields, um, starting with things like having public meetings or public events and charrettes where you invite community members to speak um, or hear about the project. And these should always include listening, gathering input, sharing information and advising about some of the background of the project. And you really want to use this input to develop your strategy and goals and show the community that you're really invested in their wants and needs and apply them as much as you can. So the key here is to make sure that all voices are heard. And if you wanna get more information about equitable involvement, you can click this link and check out um, the website from Groundwork USA. They've got a lot of good information on how to incorporate equity into your community engagement. And then lastly, like I said, we want to keep this engagement constant throughout the entire Brownfields revitalization. Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit into the planning process. So the main point of planning or the starting point is to assess where you're at. First of all, you need to think about what kind of resources you're gonna need. You're gonna wanna look around and identify all of the financial and technical assistance that's available for your community or for your project. And lastly, you're gonna wanna develop a revitalization plan that outlines what you're going to do moving forward. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Rio Reimagine project in Phoenix, Arizona. So this river stretches along a 58 mile um, stretch that includes eight communities that live uh, along the river. And so the goal of the project is to really reconnect the people of Arizona to the, back to the river and be a catalyst for economic growth, inclusion and sustainability 
and create a regional destination that features the beauty of the water. And so they saw this river as not only as a ribbon that connected all these communities together, but an opportunity to implement a water positive project that bolsters economic growth, sustainability, and also highlights social and cultural equity. So in total, the city of Phoenix has received $3.9 million of EPA grants. And here's a list of the different grants that they have received from us in the past. But for this specific project, um, this was done under an assessment coalition grant and it was a $600,000 grant. And they had partnered with Arizona State University, the city of Avondale, Tempe and Phoenix to all kind of work together on getting this um, river reimagined. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about some specific EPA resources that can help um, get you to read the redevelopment stage for your brownfields. So we have funding that can help with a couple of different areas, including assessments, cleanup, community engagement activities, and reuse planning. So part of assessing a property is to conduct a phase one and a phase two environmental site assessment or ESA for short. Um, and a phase one environmental site assessment is basically a review of documents and data that you have on the property. So you take a look at the historical uses of the site or building that you're looking at. And let's say there's a building that is on a, a potential brownfield site and it was built before the 1960s then it's likely to contain asbestos or lead. So you're trying to get a better idea of what and where you're gonna to need to take samples on that property. That's the phase one. And then after that, we go into a phase two and a phase two ESA is where the actual data collection would take place. So you would have contractors go out onto the site, map out where samples and determine what is there and how much of those contaminants are there and kind of how to move forward with that towards the cleanup. So EPA has funding to help you with that, but it's important to mention that the EPA funding can get you to the point of redevelopment, but it doesn't actually fund the actual construction or reuse portion of revitalization. So it gets you to the point of redevelopment it helps you with cleanup and gets the property completely ready. And then that's kind of where the funding line ends. So now we're just gonna briefly look at a couple of different grants that EPA is offering. Um, I'm just gonna quickly kind of sum up what you can do under each grant. But if you see at the top, I have linked the website that gives you more details about each of these. And we also have a annual um, funding webinar in the fall. To, applications are accepted on an annual basis and um, the Center for Creative Land Recycling can also assist you with um, So first we have the community-wide assessment grant and this is where you can do activities like brownfield inventory, those environmental site assessments that I mentioned, community outreach and cleanup and reuse planning. So you have to be a state, tribe, general purpose unit of government, nonprofit 501c3, or a qualified community development agency in order to apply, but you can receive up to $500,000 and there's no match required. So for the cleanup grant, this is where you can actually get the cleanup process going. So you can do site cleanup, but you can also do reuse planning, community involvement is covered by the funding, and you can also, um, pay for the regulatory oversight fees. So in order to apply for a cleanup grant, there's a couple more requirements. You have to be the owner of the site. You have to have a completed phase two environmental site assessment report, and you have to have a period of community notification. For this grant, you can receive up to three pools of funding. So there's a 500,000, a 1 million, and a 2 million. And again, no match is required. So briefly here, we have the community-wide assessment for states and tribes, pretty similar to the previous assessment grant that I mentioned, but it's geared more towards state entities or federally recognized tribes, and you can get up to $2 million for this grant. And then we have the multi-purpose grant, which combines the assessment activities and the cleanup activities into one. Um, 
you have to have a phase two ESA for at least one brownfield site cleanup and a revitalization plan to apply for this one, but you can get up to $800,000. And the last two are the assessment coalition grant, um, which is similar to the assessment activities as before, but this is where you would partner together with another, uh, another entity to build capacity to get an application put in. And um, you can get up to $1 million under this grant. And then lastly, we have the revolving loan fund, which is a little bit different. This is where you can get loans and subgrants for site remediation. Even privately held sites are eligible for these loans. Um, it is required that you, you can demonstrate that you can effectively administer loans and manage project income, but these ones go up to $1 million. So again, if you wanna learn more, we have the link here. So when you get the slides, you can check out the website. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Noemi Emmerich Ford. She's the Brownfields Coordinator for Region 9. Thank you, Brooklyn. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As Brooklyn said, my name is Noemi, and I'm just gonna expand now upon what Brooklyn has shared with you already. First, getting into the partnerships that are needed, to develop your Brownfields team, then talk to a little bit of the that can be done in order to have an effective Brownfields program. And so adding on to the funding, there's also assistance that EPA can provide. So this would not be actual hard cash coming to you. This would be in the form of technical assistance where EPA has contractors on retainer who can do some of the work that Brooklyn talked about. So she defined what a phase one and a phase two is. So if you had identified a property in your community that you were unsure of whether it had environmental contamination or not, and you weren't really at the point where you decided, I don't know if we're ready to handle money, we just want to identify and get to the bottom of what's happening at this one site, just to step our foot in kind of brownfields for a little bit. So this is where EPA can, we can use our contractors, we'll come out, do the work for you, and then we can tell you what the extent of contamination is on that property. And that's what's called our Targeted Brownfields Assessment Program. It's a really quick two-page document that you fill out. It's online. Um, we can put a link to that in the chat so you can easily find that. The only thing we ask is that you would have to get us access to the property. So if you put in an application and you are not the owner of that property, but would still like to know the environmental information, about that property, you would have to have a relationship with that property owner and get that property owner to sign that access agreement that would allow EPA's contractors on the site. The other kind of assistance that we have is contractors, again, that are on retainer, but on retainer to help you in some of the planning stages that Brooklyn talked about. And so in that, we our consultants can work with you to develop a site design to look at market analysis within your community. Maybe there's a certain area that you're looking at and you're really trying to create a more walkable community. Maybe there's an area that you're trying to create safe routes to schools or safe routes to your transportation to try to limit vehicle miles traveled. Um, or just trying to make a project more sustainable, looking at green building or elements that you can add to your project. That's all assistance that we can provide with expert consultants that we have on retainer that can help you develop that plan. And so typically to get that kind of assistance, you would need to have a property identified and either have gotten one of our grants or worked with us through our targeted Brownfields assessment program. So next slide. So as part of the planning, kind of building on what um, Brooklyn has talked about the funding, now you're at the point where you need to um, think about what do you want the redevelopment to look like in your community? What do you want the revitalization um, to look like? So first and foremost, what you're gonna hear throughout and have already heard throughout this presentation is that you need to collaborate uh, with partners. So public funding alone is not gonna make projects happen. So you need to have a variety of partnerships, whether they're private or foundation or other entities to make projects come to fruition. And then think about what your overall goal is for revitalization. Are you targeting a specific area in your community? Are you targeting something like Phoenix did along the whole Rio reimagined, um, the Rio Salado River? Or like in LA, they're looking at the LA River and then there's pockets along the LA River given that it's 51 miles. Consider what it is that you're um, wanting your overall goal to look like. Connect with the community. What's their needs and concerns? Are there food deserts? Do people have equal access to um, 
walkable or close health care? Um, what is it that the community would like to see? And then map out what those needs are and see where they align with where you might have some vacant properties in your community, where property, Brownfield's properties may exist that are just sitting there vacant and underutilized. Try to identify what some of those revitalization needs are to some of these properties that you have within your community. And so the picture that you see here, um, Nye County is in Nevada. They have received funding from us, but they have partnered with several counties to use our funding to be able to identify some revitalization plan. This particular example is in the city of Bishop. It is in Inyo County, which actually happens to sit on the California side. But this was, as you can see, it was a vacant lot. A grocery store was highly needed in this community and this grocery outlet was able to um, come about in this community. And it's a larger um, complex. It's like a little shopping center where this grocery, grocery outlet is. So next slide. So now you've heard about partnerships, you've heard about planning. Now let's talk about the specific properties. So thinking about the properties in your community, the first thing that you want to look at is what needs to be done. And so we typically call kind of looking at properties is putting together an inventory. Where are these potential properties where you would like to see redevelopment happen? And so, as you can see here, we have a community, they were looking at a particular target area, and then they mapped all of the properties within their community to look at where redevelopment could happen. Prioritize those properties that you find, and then look at them based in terms of your revitalization plan. And of course, you have to understand how these properties would fit into your larger plan, because most cities already have general plans identified. Properties are already zoned. And so think about is there a need for more housing? Is there um, more walkability that's for farmers markets? Do we need more parks in our area? And think about how, as you're developing these inventories, how these properties fit into that larger plan as well. Next slide. So why do you wanna do an inventory? And the simple answer is just knowing what you have empowers you to act. So it's very hard to move forward on something if you don't have a plan of action or you don't know what you have. So in this instance, by developing this inventory, it really allows you to be proactive in trying to get your properties back on the tax roll, right? So no one wants to see these vacant properties within their community when you know you're in need of services that could be given to the residents that live there. So the idea is when you have your inventory and it's developed and it's prioritized, it also helps you highlight where you might need to make some public policy amendments. So you may have had an area that was identified as industrial, but now all of a sudden you see through over time, through maybe some haphazard planning, it's no longer really become an industrial area. Now you have a mix of a variety of things in that area. So maybe it'll help you move in a direction that you would like to in order to be sustainable and make your community um, healthier for the residents that live there. It can also, developing an inventory will also just help you market sites for redevelop, redevelopment. So if you know what you have, it's easier than to market and say, hey, this is available and try to pull in developers um, for these properties. It's also just a valuable land use planning tool. So in order for you to be able to plan, again, knowing what you have is super important. And then as you start to think about public resources, if you have this inventory, it can help you make decisions about where you might allocate some of those public resources. So you may hear complaints in your community, we need more park space, but now you can identify and start looking at, okay, based on park space, here's the land that we have available in our community, here's who owns it, and here's what is the issue with that property and why it might be sitting there vacant. So I really believe an inventory can help you make better decisions within your community when you know what you have available. So from this picture here, this is in um, Nevada. This is also part of the Nye County Coalition's grant. This was in um, White Pine County where they were focusing on this gym theater, trying to restore back a, a piece of, let's just say history that is very valuable to them. Bringing back the movie theater was something that was very important to the community. And so this is what Nye County focused on. And this was all part of them kind of identifying sites as part of their inventory. Next slide. So how do you create an inventory? And so of course, one property at a time, right? So establish your target area. Where is it that you're really trying to make revitalization happen? 
And then use your community. Your community knows the area best. So ask them about what has been there historically. Why has that property set vacant? What was there in the past? And then just go ground truth some of these properties. Go tour the sites and see what's there. Maybe, you know, it may be vacant. Um, you're thinking that it's vacant, but you go there and, and it's on your list and maybe something exists there. Maybe people are using it for um, farmer's markets or other things you may not be aware of. And part of developing the inventory too is creating a spreadsheet or a database. Consider GIS mapping kind of the site so that it's easier for, to you, for you to look at and then be able to share across city departments. So if you have something that's GIS mapped, then you'll be able to do overlays that you know maybe the, the parks department can use it or the housing department can use it. So making it electronic so that other city departments can use it with you. And then of course, to get at what some of the environmental conditions would be, without getting into formally doing a phase one assessment like Brooklyn talked about, just review some of the government databases. Find out just from looking at, you know, doing a quick Google search. Um, is, it, is it a contaminated site? Was it a former gas station? Was it a former dry cleaners? Is it part of a landfill that used to exist in your community? So just doing a little bit of review of government databases can also be helpful. And so this is in Tonopah, Nevada. And this was, the city decided this was a, a library and it was time to update their library. And so next to this library, they had a big open lot that um, needed some remediation work. And so they worked to get the site cleaned up, paved it, and now have a nice big parking lot and an updated library for the community to be able to use. And it's become a place of um, gathering for many people in the community. Next slide. And then identify your inventory, right? So part of, I mentioned doing a records review to figure out what might've existed there for the environmental concerns, but you also need to know who owns the properties. Um, in order for you to be able to make progress, you need to identify the owners. Does the city own it? Is it private ownership? Is it owned by people who live out of town or people that are in town that you could easily have access to? So next slide. And then lastly, this is kind of what we talked about earlier about prioritizing your inventory, what you need to know about your property, what actions, um, what actions might need to be taken from that inventory. How does the Brownfields property fit within the larger context of your revitalization plan? And how does this fit within your city's plan or sustainability goals? So you may have a larger general plan, but there may be an area of the city where you're really focused on trying to enhance your sustainability goals. And so some of these properties that you identify within your inventory through your partnerships, you may be able to meet some of the goals that you have set for yourself in your general plan. And this is just a follow-up picture from the library that was on the previous slide. So this is the vacant lot that was next door to the library that needed a cleanup. And as you can see, they've now paved the area. And so this is providing parking space for that library. All right, so we'll continue kind of talking about the productive reuse that can come from revitalizing your brownfields. So starting off with what do you need to do? Um, you initially need to start implementing your revitalization plan. And so this plan might incorporate sustainability or climate mitigation strategies to make your town a little bit greener and helping the environment. Um, in this stage of incorporation, you want to continue to engage the community and partners, hold events and ribbon cuttings and things like that, or um, initial like, shovel digging, like when you're uh, setting up the cleanup to keep the community engaged and included and feel like they're really a part of the revitalization process. And then you always want to ensure that equitable, equitable development is taking place. New uh, projects have been incorporating equity plans into the recreation of their reuse. And that's helping to ensure that there's equity and inclusion in the reuse process. Next, you want to leverage any public or private funding that might be available, connect with those stakeholders and partners, to see where you can access more resources to um, improve the reuse plan. And we really want to mention that try to avoid displacement where you can. We don't want these um, brownfields to cause any displacement or 
moving of people where we don't need it to be, touching on that equity piece as well. And lastly, you want to make sure you celebrate your successes throughout the whole process of Brownfields at each phase. Be excited about the progress that you've made. Make it known to the community that you're taking strides and getting things worked on. So just touching on more of that revitalization plan, we're going to look at a bunch of different examples of reuse options that can come from your brownfields. Um, so on the right, we have an example, another example from the Nye County, Nevada application. And this is um, the old pink motel that got turned into the supercharger station, a place where people can charge their electric vehicles, which encourages more um, use of electric vehicles in Nevada. So this is just one example of a reuse that you can incorporate. But if you're considering more equity um, ideas into your town, you can look at affordable housing complexes, parks and open space, walkability or transit studies, and resiliency hubs like cooling centers or food um, centers, things like that. So if you want to um, grow your economy, you can do reuse options that create more jobs like commercial um, centers, retail centers, uh, manufacturing, or fast food, or other grocery stores that can bring more food or jobs to your center, to your community. And if you're focusing more on community, this can be things like community centers, schools, or training facilities, or shelters. And you can even incorporate environment into your reuse by, like this example, doing EV charging stations, solar farms to power local businesses, or floodplain management. So next, what you're gonna wanna do is leverage those funds to boost your economy. Um, in Phoenix, Arizona, they have a lot of leveraging that has taken place. They've um, gotten $352 million in private investments. They have restored 322 acres of land and created 3,300 jobs. Um, through their revitalization. So this um, example here is the Fifth Street and Buckeye Road project. It was a big dumping site previously. They got it assessed and cleaned up and built this massive facility with other sort of commercial um, facilities as well. And um, this quote here is from the mayor of Phoenix. And it just talks about how the EPA grants allowed them to address environmentally challenged properties for the real reimagined project and others and were able to help them develop businesses and nonprofits citywide. So this is a great way to boost your economy and make connections with other stakeholders. Okay, so now it's time for our second activity. So we're gonna pull up that Zoom whiteboard one more time. Same instructions as before. Um, we have two sort of questions here. Feel free to answer either or both. Um, we're wondering what sort of barriers do does your community need to overcome to start the land revitalization process? And if you have started, what do you need to reach new milestones? All right, I see one sticky note that says a barrier is identifying the brownfields in specific commercial corridors. Yeah, sometimes identifying the brownfields is a barrier. We don't really know what to look for. That is where a phase one um, environmental site assessment could help you identify different areas that could be contaminated, just looking historically at what was there, seeing if there's potential contamination, and that might qualify it as a brownfield. And maybe you can use the EPA's targeted brownfields assessment to look a little bit closer at that commercial corridor and see what could be done. I see um, money. Yes, that is always a barrier. That is one way EPA can help. We have those grants. Um, ones that get the money into the hands of the city and ones where we allow our contractors to come out and help you. So if you're interested in looking more in the funding webinars to hear more about that money, um, that you will be able to access that through the slides afterwards. 
And um, just a reminder, if you can't see the whiteboard, feel free to put some information in the chat and I will try to call out some of the things that we see there too. I see a strong champion is needed to reach new milestones. Yeah, that is a very important part of getting, forming your team is to identifying someone who is passionate and works hard to get that project continued. All right, let's see some of these other ones. Lack of communication. I feel like there are sometimes issues, especially between um, offices and departments where the communication is a struggle as well as between local government and community. And that um, would take stronger community engagement and maybe just more training to help overcome that barrier. Get the city to allow access to the site. Yes, that, that is definitely a barrier. Um, I don't have too much experience on how to overcome that, but I do know that there are certain things that can be done. For example, there are um, there's a community that we have been talking to who has a bunch of contaminated sites that are all privately owned, and none of the owners are cooperating with getting those sites assessed. But we're looking at doing sampling on the streets that are city owned or the very, very edges of the property. So at least we can know, hey, if these streets right outside the property are contaminated, the properties themselves are likely contaminated. And that can at least kickstart that process um, if you don't have access to the site necessarily. More developer interest. That's a good one. Uh, I think that there's different ways that you can use EPA resources and CCLEAR to um, market your uh, reuse plans and, and things like that to get more developers interested, but that is definitely a, a barrier, I would say. Preset concepts of what can or can't be done. Okay, that's a good one. We have a lot of um, materials on kind of what is allowed um, under the grants and stuff like that. I don't think we have too many like preliminary designs or things like or things of that nature, but you can work with um, EPA one-on-one. -on -one. We have the ability to set up um, a meeting to discuss in more detail about your specific project. Um, and we can help make suggestions or just guide you to what sort of reuse plans you have in place or revitalization plans that might be good for your community. Training for staff and access to expert resources. Oh, that's a good one. I think partnering with EPA and CCLEAR can help you get some of those access to expert resources. Um, we have a lot of connections and we love to help people out. As far as training for staff, that one's a little bit tricky. Um, it's always hard to get people who are super devoted and, and ready to push forward projects, but those are definitely necessary to having a successful revitalization of a brownfield. Get the city to listen to community voice and not just their agenda. Yes, that's definitely a barrier. I would agree. It's important to hear the community, but sometimes the community's needs can clash with the city priority of working together and prioritizing that community engagement is important to overcoming that barrier. I see in the chat, Meredith says, convincing property owners to allow site assessment of their property. Yes, that's a good one. That's a problem that we have a lot. Um, a one thing that's always good to tell property owners is that we are not, in this instance, not an enforcement agency. If we do find contaminants, um, the Brownfields team can't force you to spend money to clean it up. We just are here to point out what's there. And um, yeah, again, we can't enforce anything. Other funding for infrastructure. Yes, so we like to see pro projects that reuse in certain parts of infrastructure. That's always a, a good thing, but leveraging the EPA grants um, can help you get other funding to improve your infrastructure as well. Yes, like stacking funding. Great, thank you for everybody who added comments. These are really helpful. 
I probably want to get moving to the last few slides because we're running out of time and we want to get to Q&A. But if anybody is interested in setting up a one-on-one -on -one meeting, we'll talk further about any of your concerns or um, barriers and figure out how to move forward specifically with your community. Okay, so now we'll just, I'll share my screen again and we will pass it over to Devin Rainwater from Seaclick. Great, thanks Brooklyn. Um, and thanks to everyone for sharing your thoughts um, during our activity. Um, I know, and, and I understand there's always questions um, every step in the land revitalization process. So I'm here again today to encourage you to consider um, the Center for Creative Land Recycling as a solid place to go to for answers and for collaborative assistance. Um, as Brooklyn said, I'm Devin Rainwater. I'm a program associate at CCLEAR and also a project coordinator for the Vacant to Vibrant effort. Um, you heard from me during our last webinar when I shared a bit about CCLEAR and what we do. So as just a reminder, we're partnered with the EPA and serve as the technical assistance to Brownfields or TAB provider for regions nine and 10. And we are partnering with EPA region nine in the Vacant to Vibrant initiative. Um, so you may also recognize the members of Seclair's Region 9 team. Jean Hammerman, myself, and Ignacia David are here as resources to you um, within the Vacant to Vibrant program, as well as as technical assistance providers. Um, and so today we spoke about the four P's within the steps of the land reuse process and the many components to creating a successful, equitable development project um, with a beneficial reuse. So on your path through each of these steps and before you even begin, I want to let you know that CCLEAR is a resource to you. Um, if you don't know who to talk to or how to begin, you can connect with CCLEAR. Um, if you're stuck and need help with next steps, or if you have a one-off question about a step, um, you can connect with us. Even if we don't have an answer, we will match you up with one of our many partners who can answer your question. Um, you can also meet more of our team on our website that's linked here and browse our many blogs um, and guides to getting started in land reuse um, at our online resource library. Um, please also connect with us directly. My email is there. Um, if you have any questions or would like to connect, please email me. Um, so I'd also like to go through and share some specific examples of the way that CCLEAR can collaborate with you in moving your project forward just by going a few of, over a few of our services. Um, so Brooklyn, if you can go to the next slide. So we are ready to collaborate with you on any of these topics and more, um, everything we covered in our presentation today. Um, for example, Noemi went over why and how you would wanna build an inventory of brownfields in your community. So we can assist you in using the tools that are available to systematically and efficiently prioritize um, the sites in your community so that you can select um, the best candidate for reuse. Um, during your planning process, you'll want to create a development plan and involve the community every step of the way. As we discussed, um, CCLEAR can assist you in determining the concerns at your site, um, assist you in creating a plan and convening a public visioning session uh, to work with you and your community to develop ideas for reuses that are supported um, and beneficial to the community. If you're looking um, for next steps in addressing any potential problems or contamination at your site, CCLEAR can assist you in understanding and applying for things uh, like the targeted brownfield assessment through EPA. Um, we'll work with you in figuring out what resources or narratives you need to pull together, um, and assist you in understanding your eligibility, staff capacity, and any questions that come up during this stage. Um, same goes for understanding um, EPA MARC funding. So that was also discussed today, either um, multi-purpose assessment, revolving loan fund, or cleanup, uh, depending on the year. So we'll answer any questions that you have about the process. And we also provide multiple rounds of review uh, for your applications to get them in good shape to apply. Um, you can check out CCLEAR's tips for getting started with applying for EPA Brownfields funding um, at this link on the slide. Um, it's on our website. So along with these services, um, CCLEAR offers a wide range of assistance, including things like crafting a 
property fact sheet uh, to attract developers to your site, um, engaging stakeholders, um, or assisting you in reaching qualified contractors for your project. Um, with all of this information, you know, ultimately, we understand you're experts in your neighborhoods and our goal in partnering with EPA as tab providers um, and in the Vacant to Vibrant initiative is to prioritize your, your land reuse needs um, and, and help you along the way to success. Um, so next slide. So uh, please continue to engage with us um, when we're talking about partnerships. You know, you already have two partners who are ready and prepared to work with you on your land reuse projects. See Clear and EPA, um, we want to meet with you. So please schedule a meeting with us using the Calendly tool. It's linked here. And we'll also put it in the chat. Um, and upcoming events, we will be engaging in a larger discussion on a lot of the topics that we touched on today at the California Land Recycling Conference. Um, we'll talk about things including revitalization and displacement, equitable community engagement, natural disasters and recovery, and so much more. Um, so join us in September for that event. Um, and please also remember to attend the third and final webinar in our three-part series. Um, on May 10th, we will take a look at the Brownfield stories that show us the many ways that you can see success um, throughout a project. So um, wrapping up today's presentation, I will pass it back to Noemi. Okay, let's see if this will work. Apologies about earlier. So it's kind of some of the key takeaways and so some of the key takeaways is um, kind of thinking about the four P's that we talk about first in your partnerships, creating your team. And so in creating your team, we're thinking about whether you as a nonprofit and thinking about um, Brownfields or you as a unit of government, whether you're at the city level or county level, or maybe you're even you know quasi state as like a joint powers authority, considering all the players you need in order to create that team to get from planning to environmental to more planning and then all the way to your reuse. And then considering, I think it was put in some of the notes earlier, select your revitalization champion. And the one that you have at the very beginning may need to change when you get to the point of development. So considering who would be the best voice within your community to help energize and get partners and funders engaged for revitalization. And then of course, continually throughout the whole process, fostering relationships, with your community and with other partners. And in that planning, in that planning, specifically focusing on um, community engagement and thinking about um, the equitable types of community engagement, meeting people where they are, going to places where they may worship, where they may play and having conversations, identifying and securing funding, talking to other state um, funders, talking to federal funders, looking at other local funding that might be available, may even going and talking to your city council who may have the ability to um, dedicate funding in particular areas. Consider private funding, looking at foundations, all of this to get towards your revitalization plan. And then of course on your properties, which is what I talked about, in order to even identify the properties, you need to know where those properties are. So developing that inventory. And then once you have that inventory, really honing in on, are these properties vacant just because they're, it's about location and it really isn't about environmental issues, but do the environmental work, partner with CCLAIR and EPA to get the assistance you need to determine if the sites really are hampered by environmental challenges so that you can move forward for reuse. And then moving towards that productive reuse. So we're always looking for you to invest and implement sustainable revitalization. We don't wanna have a brownfield site 10 years from now, and we want that productive reuse to be really centered around equitable development, not having displacement. For those who live within the community, they, even after the community is revitalized, that they're still able to live within that community, that the benefits and the impacts can be felt and used by them. So those are our four kind of P's that uh, we wanted to make it easy for you to remember as you move in towards developing a Brownfields program and getting closer to revitalization within your community. Next slide. 
So now what we wanted to move into, we've done a lot of talking. I know a lot of time has passed, but we really wanted to hear from you. So for those who may have questions, if you could take yourself off mute, um, ask your question, or if you feel more comfortable, you can put your question in the chat and we'll respond to it that way. But we're really looking here to have a dialogue and hear from you what questions you might have. So Jean, I'll turn it over to you. Great. So please put your, as Noemi said, put your question in the chat, whether you're in early stage or an established program, we want to connect you to the resources and share specialized knowledge and make sure uh, you feel that you're not alone in this process. And um, we also obviously want to inspire you. Um, you saw all the great things that uh, Brownfield Redevelopment can do to enhance uh, your communities. Um, let's throw out one question to start. Um, what advice would you give a new program? Noemi, EPA, Devin, anybody who'd like to just sort of tackle that one? Um, you're establishing a new program. Um, list some of the initial steps or some of the advice that you would give or wish somebody had given you when you know you start a new program. And those of you who are knowledgeable in the audience, uh, feel free, feel free to put your answers in the chat as well. I'll just respond from EPA and having worked with other communities. I think one of you know, some comments that we've gotten back with entities that were looking to start up a Brownfields program, let's just say it's, let's say it was centered in the economic development department, that they felt in working in local government, that it was extremely important to have political support around what they were doing, either it was from their city council people or someone in the mayor's office, that it was really important and pivotal within local government um, to have political support as you're starting to move forward in these efforts. And sort of following on that, how do you find and train a champion? We've talked about the importance of having a champion to really see this project through. It can take multiple years uh, and someone who can really um, bring uh, enthusiasm and vision for this project. So what are some of the characteristics of a champion and how have you seen them being effective in really shepherding this through? Norman, you wanna take that one too, or Brooklyn? Actually, you know, I'm going to jump oh, in. <laughs> good. Go ahead, Ignacio. Great. Good afternoon, uh, Ignacio. David here with Seek Clear, and I'm actually straddling another Zoom call here. So, but, and this is actually a lot of things that were uh, discussed today. Uh, a lot of folks commented about start starting a program. Is that uh, you know uh, needing site access or having a champion or not knowing what the reuse is, and a lot of that can be uh, you know. First, of course, uh, contacting CCLEAR, we can discuss it. And some of the resources that EPA has might come into play here, we would suggest it. And this is probably a, an, a question to, to EPA as well. Some communities might be eligible for some kind of the assistance that helps you focus in on your reuse. Because again, brownfields is not so much about the cleaning up. It's about the reuse and the projects. and the, your projects come from you know, whatever plans you have in the community. You might have a recreation plan or a housing uh, community plan or an economic development plan. And these all have to happen on your sites, the sites within the city that some of them might be brownfields or might have contamination, but you might be able to use the brownfields resources for this, whether there's a TBA or perhaps you can apply for that directed assistance that the EPA provides as well, but that's on a case by case basis. So first things first, actually uh, contact CCLEAR. And again, from this process as well, if you're talking about reuse, you will have community champions for certain reuses. And so that's how you can, you can turn these reuse champions into brownfield champions. And, and so those are, uh, early ideas there and I apologize that I have to jump off because my other meeting is also starting but I'll keep you know a text me if uh, if uh, you want me to chime in again thanks yeah so I guess maybe I'll I'll mm -hmm. just uh, Jean I know we're past our mm -hmm. time the for all of those who are on the phone and and if you do not have a brownfields program set up and you're interested in what we have shared here today, and you kind of just want to dip your toes in the water a little bit, the best way to start is through our targeted Brownfields Assessment Program. And then from there, 
getting some assistance on one particular site. So how being a catalyst, whether you're the person that's the catalyst for the change or you find a site that's the catalyst for the change, starting somewhere, right? So if setting up a team and what we've talked about sounds like that's so far out and you can't do it, but you want to start small, my recommendation would be talk to Brooklyn or I and we can get you set up. Let's identify a site. Let's do a targeted brownfields assessment on that property. Let's help you think about what studies you might need done on that property to move it towards revitalization. So that that would be kind of my parting um, advice to anyone on the phone who is really interested in trying to move forward on this. So the good news is there is a huge community that has specialized knowledge that can support you and collaborate with you uh, to help build your program and, and for you to be successful. So um, the takeaway from today is to reach out, to be in touch, and we look forward to hearing from each of you. Uh, and with that, I will close this webinar and look forward to seeing you all on part three on May 10th.